for um, for y'all, my family. So, um, if you were at Bible study Tuesday, I was transparent <laughs> about how I was feeling, um, just from a comparison and um, an inadequate standpoint. And kids, you are dismissed. Um, have fun. And um, so the crazy thing that um, I'm sure Pastor Eric didn't know, for a few years now, um, I've been battling with um, career, like what should I be doing, that kind of thing. And um, somebody had asked me, they were like, well, what, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to be in ministry. But I didn't know exactly what that meant. Um, I'm like, I, I know that I want to help people. I know that I want to, you know, do what I feel like God has called me to in whatever way that looks like. Um, so when he had asked me a few weeks back, um, I just looked at it as this was God answering what I asked for. Um, and we'll just go from there. You know, I'm open, like whatever he does. So, um, so yeah, so we'll get started. Um, we're going to pray and then we'll jump in and go from there. So God, we just thank you for this time. We thank you, uh, Lord, for everybody that's sitting here. Um, God, I thank you that each one of them have been placed here on this day for a purpose. And so God, I just ask as we, uh, dive into your word for the next few minutes that you be my mouth. Um, that I do nothing in Zoli fleshly, but I do everything in you. God, I just ask that you move on the hearts of your people. God, move me out of the way. Let them feel your presence in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you. Amen. All right. So, um, I don't have a title for what I'm going to be teaching about. Um, so if you're used to like writing titles down, the, uh, make up your own, I guess, as we go. <laughs> um, cause I thought about it. I was like, I don't, I don't know. Um, but so yeah, just however God uses you when you're going back in your notes or something that, you know, can come back to your remembrance, let that be the title. But I'm going to be, um, teaching from Joshua today. So the verse of scripture that I want to start with, that if you all could stand with me for, is going to be Joshua 6, um, 15, 21. And I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Um, and we'll go from there. All right. So it says, But it came to pass on the seventh day, that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day, only they marched around the city seven times in the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction it and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. But all the silver and the gold and the vessels of the bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted with the priests blew the, when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up to the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. So you may be seated. Um, so a few weeks back, I was just praying and asking um, when uh, Pastor Eric had asked me to teach 
I was prepared for the Sunday that Norris had taught, so I was getting ready for that, and then we, we switched, which was fine. So it gave me a little bit more time. And Jericho is what came in my spirit. And to be honest, I was like, J Jericho, what? Like, um, I, what does that got to do? Normally when I hear things, I try to relate with them. Like, okay, can I relate back to that? What does that have to do with me? Like, how can I, you know, tell a story, you know? But there wasn't anything there. So I was like, okay, well, we're gonna go with it and see what happens. This is some, a story that most people have heard of, most people know. So I'm like, okay, God, we'll, we'll go with it. So um, I wanna kind of start from before the chapter six that we read and give you like a little bit of history and we're gonna walk through it. So the first thing is in Joshua one, I titled this God's promise, right? So before Moses died, God showed him the promised land in which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and said, this is what your descendants would have. So he told him and he let him see it, but he also said, you won't be the one that's going. Like, you're not gonna go into it, but it will happen. So after Moses died, God called Joshua to lead the people and promised him that no one would be able to oppose him all the days of his life. So just the same way that God had been with Moses, he was gonna be the exact same way with Joshua. He told him, I have your back, you go forth, don't worry about anything. So when we look at who was Joshua, Joshua was Moses' assistant. Um, one cool thing was that Joshua was filled with wisdom because Moses laid his hand on him. That's what the scripture says. So Moses was also very much wise. When Moses was leading the people of Israel, um, he had set, sent out 12 spies at that time during this, this earlier, I think it's in Numbers. And Joshua was one of those 12. He sent the spies out to look at the land of Canaan to see what was going on, assess it, like figure, figure things out. So when the spies went out to do an assessment, there was 10 that went out the first time. When they did that, they came back and they gave a bad report. They're like, yeah, it's true. The land is flowing with milk and honey. However, we just don't see how God's gonna be able to do this. Like they were really questioning and doubting what God had already promised them based on what they had assessed. So then Caleb and Joshua come and they're like, well, send us, we'll go, right? So when they did that, they came back and said, yep, it is true, it's flowing with milk and honey. However, we believe that God can see us through this. God can do this for us. So because of the disobedience and um, the doubt that the 10 had and persuaded the rest of the people, as we know, the entire nation was in the desert for 40 years. However, because of what Caleb and Joshua did, God said, that that generation would be the one to enter the promised land. So when we go and continue on to Joshua 2, and we look at the place of Jericho, Jericho is located in the Jordan Valley. Um, the Jordan River is east, it's the, with the Jordan River to the east and Jerusalem to the, to the west. In order to reach Jericho, you had to cross the Jordan River. And when I researched, because I kind of geeked out on this whole thing. Um, the Jordan River was like 20 miles long, but where they had to travel to was about two miles. Um, I can imagine what Jericho looked like, right? It was called the City of Palm Trees. So to me, it was probably a very beautiful place. However, it was under the judgment of God. So Jericho was bolted and shut because they were afraid of the Israelites. So they were trying to protect something that actually did not even belong to them. Um, no one could enter there. Um, it was, you know, a place, a fortress, basically. So imagine, if you will, because I like to do this, it's surrounded by huge stones. The stone walls are about five feet wide and 14 feet tall. So if you read that in Joshua 6, you would imagine if somebody is our height or whatever, like that does look like something that we would not be able to do because of the size of it and how it's surrounded, and it's surrounded by stone. It's not like glass or something like that. This is something that um, in a, a normal person's mind, 
you would kind of be like those 10 spies and think this is something that God couldn't possibly do because it looked like the impossible. So when we move further in the story, um, Joshua kind of mimics exactly what Moses did and he sends out two spies to assess what's happening there. They come to Rahab, Rahab who is a harlot and she hides and protects them. So she's hiding and protect them from the king of Jericho. Now, when we read about that, we've all heard about Rahab and her part or perspective that I looked at, it was very much interesting. And I'll get to it later because I was like, why was she so willing to do that? Because she didn't have to. And why was God's instruction to go there? Um, her place where her house was, it was located on the wall to where it was easy access. You could get in and out and it was the only location like that. So it was very strategic. So in Joshua 2, 8 and 9, it says she, uh, before they laid down after the king had sent two men to her place and said, um, we know we, we heard that there were two spies here. And she was like, yeah, but I don't know where they went. Right. So she didn't like technically lie but <laughs> she kind of did. So um, she said in, in Joshua 2, 8 and 9, it says, now before they laid down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint hearted because of you. This was interesting to me because if you think about her past and who she was, she was very confident in the fact that she said, I know that the Lord sent y'all. So I'm sitting here again, wondering, interesting how she had been so far from God, but yet she still had a fear and a reverence in some kind of way. She knew exactly what God had promised them because she confirmed it when they got there. So she goes on to say in scripture, She's like, I know, I've heard about you guys. I know what you did at the Red Sea. I know who you've defeated, all of this. And so because of that, she said, if I keep a secret, basically, that you guys are, have been here, I, in return, need for me and my family to be saved. So to me, that was a huge step in faith because um, like, they could have said no, they could have did anything, but they were like, yeah, we'll do that for you. So she was given specific instructions by hanging um, the red thing from a window and all of that so that she would be saved. So keep that in mind. We're still doing recapping to get us to where the scripture is. So in Joshua 3, I call this the call of Joshua, right? Um, Moses had led the people of Israel for 40 years. And with Joshua being his assistant, he was next in charge. So. God begins to honor Joshua in front of the people of Israel, the same type of thing that he did with Moses. Um, when he was leading Moses, like I talked about on Tuesday, that was more of a struggle because, you know, he goes to him and Moses is like, I can't, I, I don't want to, want to. It took him four times before he was just like, you know what, let somebody else do it because I don't feel like I am equipped to do this, right? Joshua wasn't like that. So when God gave him the call, he was like, all right, yep, I'm here. So to show that he had the backing of God, God still did things the same way with the demonstrations of power, right? To let the people know that, hey, I am still your God, I am still in control, and that you can trust Joshua's leadership. So an example of that is when they were crossing the Jordan. Um, God gave Joshua the instruction that the priest would carry the Ark of the Lord first and as soon as his feet touched the bank, that it would dry up. So like I said earlier, the Jordan was a huge river, right? Um, I'm sure that it probably was very similar to what we would have thought about with the Red Sea. Um, and when you think about how many people that there were that needed to cross it, this blew my mind, right? So when I was reading through everything, we're talking in the numbers range, right? there was 600,000 men. So this wasn't like 12 people. These were thousands of people that were being led across this river. And that's not including women and children. 
So it could have easily been a million people. So keep that in your mind. Um, it took a two mile journey to go across that. Two mile journey with that amount of people. That's a lot, right? Um, so they obeyed exactly what the instruction, instructions were. And as soon as the priest's foot stepped in the river, it became dry so they could walk across. So if you keep going through the scriptures before we get to the actual walls falling down, um, the commander of the Lord shows up in Joshua 5. When um, Joshua was near Jericho, he looked and he saw a man who stood opposite of him and his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua asked, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he said, neither. I am the commander of the Lord. Now, I always like to read the scripture because... For me, I feel like it settles us with things that are going around in our culture. It's always, well, are you for us or are you against us? Are you on this side or are you on that side? And so I think it's important for us to say, neither. I am with God. So whatever that truth is, that's where we line up to. It's neither for or against on either one, right? So God gives Joshua specific instructions. And this is when he lays out all the soldiers, the men, the people. I want them to march around six times for six, uh, one time for six days and seven, to seven times on the seventh day. I want the seven priests to carry the seven ram's horns uh, 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 ahead of the ark. God works in patterns and in numbers. And it always fascinates me, sevens and twelves and all of this stuff. And, and they kind of all like work together because when you're reading things, you're like, oh, this was, he, did, he chose seven for this and 12 for this. And it, it always blows my mind. So I always like to see that, the patterns. And then um, he again gave him the instructions of once you hear that all of the troops, the trumpets that um, everybody needs to shout and the walls will, um, come down. So this leads us back up to where we started in the beginning of the strip in the scripture. If you look back on the journey that it took for them to get to the place where they started um, the, 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 the fight of Jericho, I'll call it that, um, they had to go through a lot. Like they had to go through uh, obedience. They had to have faith in their leader. They had to, um, I feel like they had Joshua, you know, God told him several times, be strong and courageous. He had to keep that um, mentality, if you will, the whole time, because you're leading thousands of people, if not a million, still couldn't find the actual number. But still, that's a lot of people to lead. And you're going to overtake a place that looks like it's impossible. Um, it's surrounded, right? but they had God on their side, therefore um, they continued. So what's the significance of all of this? Like why, why am I even talking to y'all about this? Um, number one, I think that this whole thing shows the miraculous work of God. So God is God, right? And have you ever considered that he could have just knocked the walls down? Like, he could have just been like, walls come down, and they would have came down. But he didn't do that. He made them work. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, think about, first of all, I had to look at this too. Again, I kind of geeked out a little bit. How long did it take them, or how far was it to walk around? So a mile, right? We don't, you know, I barely like to walk a mile, and I'm out of breath. So imagine thousands of people walking around a place that looks like it's impossible when God truly could have just like that and it would have came down, but they didn't. He allowed them to work. He allowed them to continue to have faith and obedience. And I imagine like in my head, I was thinking because these people were for Joshua and I feel like they knew who was with them, I feel like they were building their spirits up every time they would take that lap around, I'm gonna say a lap, but that mile around. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it was, this is ours. It belongs to us. We're gonna get this land because God promised us. They didn't know exactly like 
how it was going to like they are trusting God to like, you know, hopefully once this <laughs> we go around here, the walls are going to fall down. But, you know, that that was that was interesting to me. So think about this. If I'm going to give you all this this story, my middle son, when he walks the house, he um, is loud, meaning I can hear him coming up and down the steps and it's always like boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, what in the world are you doing? Or there's been times when I've been at work um, in the office and you can hear somebody that's, that has a heavy walk, you can hear them walking, right? And sometimes you'll feel the vibration of the floor because <laughs> they're walking so heavy, right? Um, have you ever considered or thought about why he asked them to march? Why was it a march? He didn't say skip and he didn't say take your little, he asked them to march. So hopefully I'm not gonna break anything. But if you're marching, you're doing this, right? You're marching. That is a sound. And when that's a million people making that sound and vibration, if you think about science, there's sound waves. Anytime there's vibration and there's a boom, a boom, a boom, things have to change and move. I'm like, God, you're so smart. That is dope to me. Like you were using sound up their feet to create this vibration for those walls to like loosen up so that by the time the seventh day came, it was like the instant of it falling down. Imagine that by the time those walls were loosening with them steadily marching around and on the seventh day, the trumpets, that added a whole nother sound. And with the whole million people or 600,000, heck, it could have been 25,000. Imagine when you're at a Carolina Panthers game or wherever you are and you hear people roaring and it's like, I watched the movie 300, right? I love that movie. And when he's like, uh, whatever the, the team is or whatever, and they all are like, yeah! like I can imagine that is what that sounds, sound was, but a million or so people. So by the time that they walked around the sixth time and then on the seventh time, they had to do seven miles because it's one mile. And with that roar, the walls come down. Stone walls, 14 feet high. However, they, however big they were, they come down. And I'm like, God, you're that smart. <laughs> you're that smart to use whatever part of the brain that is, whatever that looks like, to incorporate sound and vibration and frequency. So to me, any time that it's lift your voice or make a joyful noise, even though it might be five of us in here, that doesn't mean that the sound that we are projecting is not vibrating out to Africa or wherever it needs to be, all through Burlington to make the walls come down. So the second part here is God has to fulfill his promises. So the interesting thing to me here is even if like, so God promised this land hundreds of years ago and the unbelief and the disobedience of those 10 spies and then how they came back and they were all talking to each other and saying, we don't feel like, we don't think God can do this. They were stuck in a place for 40 years, right? Because of their disobedience. God's promise still had to be fulfilled even if he had a whole new generation to do it. All of that generation that was with Moses was wiped clean. They didn't get to do what this new generation did because of their walk in disobedience and because of their unbelief. So generational blessings and generational, generational curses are a big deal. So there are things that 
people in my mind, people that came before us could have prayed about, your great, great grandmother had prayed about, and that promise is still fulfilling itself. It's very important on the things that we, our generation do, that can affect the generations to come. So whatever God has said, no matter if he does it like a Moses and says it's going to happen, but you won't be here to see it, he still has to fulfill his promises. The, sec the third thing that I have is answer the call. So when God is with you and you are obedient to his word, nothing can stop you. So like I talked about on Tuesday, even though God still used Moses after he kind of like whined and complained and was like, I really don't want to do it, da 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 da, da um, Joshua's posture was a little bit different in the fact that he was like, all right, yeah, I got it, send me. There wasn't that back and forth thing with him. It was like whatever God said, he did it. No matter what it looked like, no matter whatever it was, he did it. So that would be my encouragement to you is whatever the call is, answer it. Do it afraid. Whatever, do it. Whatever God says, answer it. So um, I put in here, because I haven't got all off my notes. It doesn't matter. Number four, <laughs> I have um, God is a restorer. So what I mean by that is this whole part with Rahab, right? He had a plan for Rahab. It was amazing, again, to me that through all of this, God knew exactly what was going to happen. Um, he picked that specific location. Just so happened Rahab lived there. Um, she didn't, she was very much willing because she already had something in her that she knew about God, even though she was in her mess. There was still something there that I feel like it was two sided. One side, it was the fact that from a physical standpoint, I really think she wanted she wanted to be safe. I want you to save me and my family. But at the same time, I feel like her spirit was calling out to be saved to for for her to be restored. And God did exactly that. Um, there was things that um, because of the demonstrated work that had happened before that she was able to see, it was like, I believe God, I believe you. And I think that's a thing that's very important for us. It's very important to me that we don't just come to church day in and day out and be here and there is no demonstration. The demonstration of the work of God and the power of God, that draws people. Like. Pastor Eric talks about it all the time. If you look through scripture, you know, there were many people that would see the miracles and all of the things that God was doing. That's because they saw the works. There were, there were no, um, I don't want to say soft Christians, but there, there was none. Like, there, like, we have to get outside of the, I don't know what it is, because I'm talking to myself too. We have power within us. And we have to be able to demonstrate that because I really think that that's what helps people, right? To know that God is real. And in this situation, that is what helped Rahab because she had heard and she had saw and she's like, can't nobody do that but God. How are y'all able to do that, right? So during that time in Joshua 2, 11, she says, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. And so God took Rahab, who was a Gentile, out of her mess and, she, and put her with the Israelites. So I think, again, the cry was not only for the physical part, but during that, that's when Rahab found her salvation. So God restored her. So that was something awesome that came out of that again. So my last point here is obey what God says, even if it doesn't line up with what you think. So in other words, Hold tight to God's word and loose to your own picture. I have so many of these examples where I think, today is a good one too, where I think I know what this should look like for me. And I feel like it should go this way. And then the moment that it doesn't go this way, oh, that ain't God. Mm -mm. That ain't God, right? That's how you would think. It's not God because it didn't go the way that you wanted it to go. 
but a lot of times it's not. It's not. It, a lot of times it's not going to be how you feel like it should be in your head because God knows what's best. So make sure, you know, um, that you don't already paint a picture for God, because number one, when it doesn't happen that way, I've, I've been through it several times. You've been getting to doubt God yeah. when that was not the intention. It was your picture. It wasn't his. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to hold loose to that. Can you imagine, again, holding loose to your picture? You would think that if somebody was going to go and tear down some walls, that they're going to need some kind of weapon or some kind of something. They're not going to be marching around it. That just don't even look right. They don't even sound right. In order for stone walls to fall, we're just going to march. I'm reminded of the story that Pastor E talked about where there was the guy that... Um, did a cartwheel outside of a gas station or something like that. And the girl that drove by had been praying and was like, God, if you really will, or if you want me to not commit suicide or whatever the story was, I need to see somebody do some cartwheels. Well, I'm pretty sure in his head, he was thinking, what in the world I need to do cartwheels for? Like, that's stupid. I don't understand. But God, anyway, I'm going to answer the call and I'm going to go ahead and do the cartwheels. And he did that. So no matter what things look like, it doesn't matter if it's not, you know, it could be something, I don't know, out of the, out of the, um, it's not the ordinary thing to do. Don't question that it's not God, you know, go ahead and answer the call, right? So um, I think about how there was, um, I was, I wrote down the this, this scripture that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And I feel like from, uh, I, God is like so strategic to me. I feel like from that perspective, he knew that he could use them, that he could use their obedience. He didn't necessarily, like, it wasn't like, their weakness was the fact that we can't do this alone, right? So God used what was in their hand. And it turns out it was their feet to march that did it. They didn't have weapons and all of that stuff. So it's like God can use what's in your hand, even though it looks like I may not have much or I may not have this or that. But he took their bodies basically and their voice in order to create something that was looked like the impossible in order to conquer Jericho. So always like just be mindful from a kind of like what I was talking about Tuesday when you're feeling inadequate or you feel like you don't have enough scripture has shown how God can use whatever is in your hand he can use what you were gifted with even though they may not it may not be discovered right by you um he can use that so did I go too fast because I'm almost done <laughs> Um, all right. So, um, so I want you to think about this. Um, Jericho was blocking the promised land and it had to be demol demolished in order for God's promises to be fulfilled. And although God let the army, this still, they still had to put work in, right? They still had to be obedient. They still had to have faith. They still had to have patience. Um, Physically, they had to march again. So they had to still do the work. And I think, you know, sometimes we feel like when we've asked God to do something that sometimes we feel like we don't have to do anything. But how many of you know that waiting is an action? Yeah. So just because you're waiting, that doesn't mean that you're doing nothing. You know, while you're waiting, you're still trusting. While you're waiting, you're still having faith. While you're waiting, you're still being obedient. So you still are putting in the work. So it's not like, you know, waiting means that I'm not going to do anything. Sometimes when we don't get the direction that we would like to have, waiting becomes sometimes the best thing to do so that you're not moving outside of your own self and you're waiting to see what God is having to say. So as we close, if if you could, I would like for you to um, just kind of have a moment with you and God right now. Um, while I was praying, 
I, you know, was just thinking about um, people, like who would be here today? What would they possibly need? Um, and so um, I'm gonna like pray, but I'm also gonna be talking at the same time, I guess, while I'm praying. So if you could just close your eyes right now. Um, God, I'd like to just thank you for this day. Um, God, I just pray um, for everyone that's here right now. Um, I feel like that there might be people here where God has promised you something and it has not come to pass yet. I'd like for you, um, and you think because it hasn't come to pass yet, that it's not going to and you're starting to doubt God. Like, did you really say that? Um, because I don't see it yet. But I want you to be mindful of when that happened with the 10 spies. They had to wait longer than probably what they should have had to wait it for. They had to spend the 40 years in the desert because they were being disobedient and because they didn't trust and believe in something that God had already said that they were gonna, that he was gonna do for them. And then I feel like um, there was a group of people here that there are walls in your life that you're not allowing to come down that God is trying to break, but you won't let them go. Um, it's walls of fear, it's walls of depression, it's walls of anxiety, it's walls of doubt, it's walls of rejection, and there's walls of unforgiveness. And God wants you to let them go. And you keep holding on to it. So I would just ask you to let that go. Give it to God because his hands are bigger than yours and he can take it. So God, I just ask right now that you move on the hearts of your people, Lord. Every wall right now, drop, fall in the name of Jesus. Every wall that doesn't belong, I ask that you demolish it right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I feel like um, if you do need prayer and you want somebody to pray with you, just raise your hand. Thank you, Lord. 